So, today reading screenplays. Hmm, which we should have been doing for a long time. And some of you have. Three big questions. Why should you read? What is there to read? And how should you read? Now, once we've covered those, I would like to hear from you guys. What have you learned from reading scripts so far, uh, both inside and outside immersion screenwriting? Yesterday, we didn't get to that. Uh, today, I'm pretty confident we will. So let's look at that first question. Why should you read scripts at all? Why shouldn't you just, you know, watch great movies, um, do some masterclasses and courses, and then write your screenplays? Yeah, so th there are a number of reasons why you should read scripts. I always look at the key skills you need to have as threefold. In order to become a good screenwriter, you need to have a good understanding of story. Now you can say you can get that from, from watching movies. And it's true. You can get a good understanding of story and structure by just watching the films. Now, the other skill is script writing. So the, the style, the execution on the page, that is a skill you absolutely need in order to be successful. And there is no shortcut but to read scripts. And then the third is sales. You can be an amazing screenwriter with fresh, innovative, imaginative ideas. And you can have the skill to execute those on the page, but without the skill to selling them, to sell them, you're nowhere. You won't have a career. Now, how can you learn that third skill of selling from reading scripts? Well, we'll get to that. You can break down a structure from watching a film. In fact, I find it easier. It is easier because directors underscore the structural elements in their films and, and TV shows in many, many ways. It is through music. It is through transi transitions, uh, sometimes through color, through pacing. A whole lot of things help us in identifying the structural elements in uh, screen production. And for that, you don't need to read the script. So story, concept, and structure, yes, you can study that from the finished product. And you can often do that faster because reading a script, depending on the style of the writer, can take a long time. And watching the film, TV show, only takes as long as it is, right? Then again, you often need to rewatch it to detect certain things you may not have picked up in the first place. Now, why would you or rather, how can you still learn about story from reading scripts? It's by comparing the finished product with the film, uh, with the script, you'll see where difference, differences are, where decisions were made in terms of leaving out uh, scenes, reorganizing scenes. And that has to do with structure. That has to do with storytelling. And from just watching the film, you don't see any of those processes. You, you, you may not be aware of the challenges that the writers uh, occurred. Because um, as a writer, there may be certain things that you will intuitively do and will most people do. But once you go to the edit, things may feel very different. So by reading the scripts that are often uh, earlier versions, pre-shooting drafts, and comparing them to the finished product, you may still learn a lot about structure. But you only obviously realize that once, once you start reading. Then the second one is pretty obvious, you know, style, uh, how to write in an engaging way, what are the techniques you can use, what are the tricks to keep the reader interested. You can figure that out from, from reading the scripts. And then um, the sales, sales part of it, it's good to read what is out there read spec scripts that people are circulating in order to sell. So you see what else is out there. And by reading a lot of unproduced scripts, you will get a sense of um, not just what is fashionable today, but also how many similar stories are being told. I spoke with many writers who believed that their work was stolen. They had written a script and then they saw a film that was very similar to theirs. That is so common. And the more scripts you read, the more you're aware of that. And, and you know, the, the more you may be working on ways around that and thinking about uh, how to, you know, fit 
your own voice into that universe of stories rather than stress over um, it being stolen. So there you go, story, script sales, the three skills you can improve, you can enhance from reading screenplay. So those, those are the whys. Now, next, next question was, what is it that you should read? So what, do, what should you read? Well, the first answer would be everything, everything you can lay your hands on, depending on how much time you have, obviously. Now, there are different types of screenplays. I've already mentioned the spec script. The spec script is a script that you will be writing, a script that you write in your own time. You're not getting paid for it, that you use as a calling card to break in. Hopefully, it may get made sooner or later. So it is the, the script that is developed outside a production company um, by the writer. Second one is studio script. There's a script that is developed within a studio um, that, that is commissioned. The writer is getting paid for it. They're very different. It means that the writer already has a certain level of kudos. They don't have to prove their worth as much as you would with your early spec scripts. Now, there are established screenwriters who are still punching out spec scripts and you are competing with them. That's another reason, reason why you need to deliver work of a very high standard. The studio scripts are uh, a different beast. They are uh, sometimes closer to a production draft because there's a, a greater confidence that they will actually be made. And they look different for that reason. Spec scripts are all about selling, are all about seducing the reader into the story and much less about the technical aspects, whereas the studio obviously starts thinking about production aspects as well. Now, for both types of scripts, there are different versions. So most or let's say much of what you will find online or rather used to find it, 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 things are changing and I'll, I'll mention that in a minute but early drafts were uh, a few years ago were the type that was really flooding the internet and I think it's because some of the Hollywood executives were sharing a lot of their scripts and they leaked and then they got into the um, I was going to say public domain but that, that is that's not the right term they were getting into um, the forums and so forth. So you, you would get to read a, a lot of spec scripts in early drafts. Then once you move on, you will find production scripts, shooting scripts, uh, scripts that, that are uh, already under license, that, are, um, that have been purchased and that are going to production. So now the writer is, is writing a draft specifically for production. Those are going to be different. There's going to be potentially more detail, more technical detail. There may be um, camera angles, there may be shots, transitions, and things like that. And ultimately, there's a, a third type of scripts that you won't find that often at all. That's post-production. Post-production script. Wh why are they being produced? They're produced for you know airlines, for subtitlers, um, all those people who need to offer, or advertisers uh, to know uh, where all those technical aspects that have to do with what happens with the film once the film is produced. And um, th those are, are often not written by the writers themselves. They're based on the writer draft, but they're, as I said, very technical. That you know, any intern in a production company could be uh, tasked with writing that post-production script. They're rare, as I said, they're uh, overly technical and they're always an exact replica of what the film uh, ultimately is. So those are the, the ones that you need to read. I think, I hope that answers Vivian's question. Vivian, does that answer your question about the differences between this, the types of scripts? Okay, so I just want to know if you have an example of a spec script, maybe one or two pages, and um, if we are writing to submit to a competition, then what format do we need to use? Okay, hang on. So, so two questions. You want to see an example of a spec script? Yeah. And what format to use when you submit to a competition? competition? And what format do you use when you submit to a producer? Yeah. Yeah. I'll answer the second one because that's uh, the easiest. You use the same format as you would otherwise use. So uh, a spec screenplay is, a, is what we call a master scene screenplay where you don't include technical details. So it's all just about readability, it's about getting the story out uh, with minimal technical uh, directorial elements. 
So it's it's the the standard that you will see in most scripts. It's the standard that is described in David Trottier's book, The Screenwriter's Bible. And it is also the the I'd say the average type of style you'll find in most of the blacklist scripts. Because that is, I should have mentioned that. It's a really good source for um, spec screenplays to know what is out there, what is fashionable. Every year, the blacklist uh, publishes the most promising, the hottest spec screenplays that are going around in Hollywood. And if you can lay your hands on some of those, then they're a really good example. So that that's the type that you, that's the, that's the format you um, submit. Um, and a little bit further in, I'll give you, I'll show you examples of different sort of scripts, different writers, uh, different styles, and you'll see that different writers get away with, with um, you know, different styles. So then there's also a, a type of script you need to be aware of and careful with because you might be fooled like I was. And fortunately, the immersion uh, uh, students didn't notice, but there was very, very briefly a fake screenplay somewhere hidden in the immersion uh, course. And it was this one. It's an episode of Rick and Morty. And I think the episode's called Rick, Rick, Boom, Boom. And I was looking for the Rick and Morty pilot and I couldn't find it, I thought I found it, and I included it in the course, and then at closer inspection, um, I don't believe that this holds up. I don't think it stands the test. It's definitely not a pilot, and, I, and I, I'm not a Rick and Morty uh, expert. I've seen a few episodes, and I like them. I never had the time to, to see much, but reading this, I got a sense that this is not um, of the standard of, of the show. So I think this is fan fiction. This is um, a spec written by someone who's trying to break into the industry and who, who used the Rick and Morty show to do that. Um, how can you tell? Well, you know, it's in some cases it's hard. If you're a fan of the show, you'll probably see it easily, probably see it more easily than I did. But there is another, there's another way of um, uh, figuring it out. In this case, you see it has the branding. It has the Rick and Morty branding. It, it says network draft. And in fact, I have not found any other Rick and Morty scripts than the ones that uh, came out of the official writer's room in this format. So it has the heading with the series title, episode title, network draft, and draft date. Um, a student at one of the Sydney film schools this past week analyzed a uh, scene from Quentin Tarantino's Inglourious Bastards. Here we go. Exterior Dairy Farm Day. Now look at that slug line. Uh, my students would fail formatting if they were to deliver anything of this kind because that's not how you format uh, a slug line. It's, it's just plain wrong and it looks ugly. So you would need a full stop there, you needed space there, more space at the back. And so I read on, and there's, there's a lot of stuff there that's not quite right, but you know, it's Tarantino. One moment he calls them, uh, the soldiers, Nazis, and then on the second page, he calls them uh, a representative of the Nas National Socialist Party, which you know is, totally going against the standard of concision. But this struck me as well. Look at this um, dialogue bit. You have the character name roughly in the middle, and then you have dialogue so far to the left. It just didn't look right to me. So that is, that's just striking. Um, was Tarantino not using the right software? And then I thought, okay, let's check. I have a copy of this screenplay as well. Now, here's an example of a screenplay where it seems that the original has disappeared off the internet. There was a time when you could fairly easily find this, but if you've followed the news around Tarantino and his recent films, he got increasingly increasingly frustrated how his, his scripts got leaked on the internet. Maybe his lawyers have taken them all down. But this is an original, you can tell, because it's a photocopy. 
These files are usually bigger. They're usually in the range of five to 10 megabytes, whereas the electronic files, like the one that you just saw, are under a megabyte because they're just electronic data, where this is visual, this is image data, and it, it uh, just takes more space. And look at this. The same dialogue now is correctly formatted. So I got to give Tarantino a little bit more credit here. His original script um, didn't look quite as bad as the the ripoff version that you find on the on the web. All right, before we go on, I want to see if there are any questions up to this point. Oh, I have two short questions. Yeah, uh, Leon. What happens when you read a script that's more than five or ten years old? It's invariably in a different format to what I think we write in these days. So. What's the benefit in reading old scripts? Um, let's go back to the three reasons why you read scripts. For story, for script execution, and for sales. Um, for sales, you don't need to read old scripts because you know what, what, what got made and what, and what was successful. Um, for style, um, older scripts are indeed different in style. If you go and, and, and you, you know, a few weeks back here, we spoke about in the heat of the night and we made it, we might have also looked at the scene that looked very different. And also, it looked more like a studio script. You'll find that all the scripts have a lot more detail, a lot more description. These days, script style needs to be leaner. So you're not going to go into the same amount of detail as, as people used to write. So you need to be aware of the, the, the going style these days. That said, if you were here a few weeks ago, we were talking about action writing. And one of the best examples was a script from the 1970s, uh, Walter Hill's draft for Alien. So th there are reasons to go back and, and read exceptional screenplays. I was just before we started this masterclass, I was listening to a podcast with Taylor Sheridan, who is right now my absolute favorite screenwriter. And um, he listed his favorite five movies. And among those, there was no, none from the past five years. Godfather was listed, Unforgiven was listed, Kramer versus Kramer was listed. And those, the, the, the scripts are still available. I mean, um, at least I found the script for Kramer versus Kramer. I don't know if, whether you can still find it online, but at least it's in my collection. And it's an original, it's, you know, it's, it's a photocopy of the, of the original screenplay. Um, there, there are absolutely merits in reading that script because when you watch a film, and for instance, for dialogue, you are much less aware of the mechanics and the dynamics and how that dialogue looks on the page than when you were actually opening the, the screenplay. And the description may still be written in a different sort of style, but it, I think it's incredibly valuable to, to read those older successful screenplays for other reasons. This is how some producers read a screenplay. You know, Universal is begging me for this script, but I don't want to give it to them because they screwed me once. You really ought to take a look at this. Yeah, take a look at it. Yeah. Starch times. That's it, isn't it? What's going on, man? All this, yeah. yeah. Right? Gotcha, suckers. Wow, that is a catchphrase. Isn't huh? that good? I, I just saw the poster. Let's be risky today, huh? I'm going to go with this. You know what? You bring me this script and Kit Ramsey. And you got yourself a go picture, Bobby. Oh, okay. Oh, thanks. Here you come. Oh, thanks. I love what you do. Here's my card. Oh, uh, uh, just keep that. <laughs> yeah, I love that scene. I love that movie. It's one of my absolute favorite comedies about the movie business. It's called Bowfinger. Check it out. The scene was set at the Dome restaurant in San, on Sunset Boulevard. It's no longer there. At the time when the film was uh, uh, shot, it was run by a fellow Belgian who came from very close to where I was born in Limburg and visited him several times when I would go to LA. And um, yeah, you, you would always come across celebrities there. So how does a producer read a screenplay? It takes how long? 20 seconds. It looks at the cover page, it looks at the title of the cover page, looks at the first scene, starts nice, and then all this, and he <laughs> flicks through the script, 
<laughs> and he goes to the final scene and the final line and uh, you know catchphrase gotcha suckers um of course not but yeah a little bit of that still you know first impression is absolutely critical and i i would always say you know, even the flicking through that script in like two seconds gives an impression to the producer of how much dialogue is in that film immersion is all about what you learn from the scripts that you read and write and copy so if you've been keeping up to speed you should have read by now the americans pilot meet the parents and gravity for the TV students, you would have read by now Breaking Bad, Parks and Rec, Big Little Lies, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Mad Men, and Arrested Development. So what have you learned from Immersion so far? Think about it for a minute and type your answer in the chat. In the meantime, I'll give you what I learned from, um, from Gravity, the way slug lines are written for a movie that's set in space you know this is no day or night there um for breaking bad i learned that the script was um a fairly early draft it was before they had locked off the setting the location for the production because the fans know that the whole series was shot in new mexico in albuquerque but the pilot was written to be shot in california still because vince gilligan was already working in LA and you know naturally assumed that that was going to be set there um, for the Americans that's a really good example of a script that is multi-layered there's a lot going on it's, it's very dense it doesn't feel like that there's no it doesn't feel like exposition there's always a high tension high um, stakes in the meantime, you pick up a whole lot of important aspects of that show. So Anthony says he learns how fast the jokes come. That's, that's a really good one. And I think that's probably one of the biggest differences between that fake um, Rick and Morty screenplay and any of the real ones. There's just a lot more uh, fun in the real ones. Vivian says, from Gravity, I learned about mini slug lines. Yeah, there's... Um, ones that I refer to as well. Anthony says the energy of the character comes through. Anthony, can you elaborate on that? Uh, which, which script is that in particular? And how, how does that happen on the page? How does the energy of the character come through? Um, well, particularly for Brooklyn 99 and Parks and Creation. And as I type that reflection, look like I'm actually, I love those two shows. So, I'm not actually sure, like maybe it's the fact that I actually already know what the characters are like. But, um, but as I was reading it, the the purpose of the character was there. I think it was in um, the, the first <coughs> moment of the pilot, there's Peralta and, um, uh, and what's her name, um, and their partners. And within the first 30 to 40 seconds, we already understand their relationship. And it was very fast. Um, thanks, Anthony. Louise says, I've learned that I prefer scripts that manage flashbacks well. I don't think I'll tackle uh, flashbacks for a while. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so it, it shows to you how hard it is. Is that right? Yeah. They're very difficult to write. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, you see, the, I think that's one of the signs of your growth as a writer is that you identify those things. So from, from reading the scripts, you, you realize those things and you'll now be less likely to go in and, and make a, a rather obvious mistake that, that the, the writer who hasn't read the script would do because, you know, flashback is the easy way, they think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, and then Nandi says, meet the parents, how to write two characters speaking simultaneously. Oh, that's an interesting one. All right. Can you just quickly elaborate on that? Nandi, while I prepare uh, a scene for you. I'm going to share a script that where that happens as well. But can you elaborate on how it how it happens in Meet the Parents? One where they had the two characters' names um, juxtaposed, and then because it was a very short line, something oh, I've actually scrolled past it now. 
so it was a very sh short line and so it was hey sweet pea and the other one was saying daddy um so the father and the daughter jack and pam and they just had jack slash pam and then in the same dialogue line hey sweetie slash daddy and so you knew who was saying what and then further down in the script they also had when um, jack and um, greg so the father and greg the ben stiller character were riding in the car and there was this awkward silence and you could see that they were both you know desperately trying to trying to think of something to say and then they both come out with something and in that case they had the the two um characters on the same line but in sort of like in separate columns and yep. then the, the dialogue that each one said under that that second example is called dual dialogue and dual dialogue is a feature that was a while ago only possible in final draft but now pretty much everybody does it um i'm sharing the wrong one here um even caltex has that has that function now because you can do it doesn't mean you have to do it and th this was the example i gave yesterday from midsummer in midsummer the horror movie by ari aster um, of last year um, there's a lot of dual dialogue and i would say for a spec screenplay this is too much because it's clotted and um you know it's always it, it's kind of it interrupts the reading it, it, where normal dialogue is just vertical you keep moving whereas dual dialogue it's slower because you've got more text and also it, it just it's slightly jarring on the page. So here you see where many screenplays just don't have any dual dialogue, where it, where it occurs, you'll have it once or twice. Here it just keeps, keeps going. So we got two here and then we go to the next page and there's more and more and then more. Um, I'd say find a, an alternative way of dealing with it rather than doing this dual dialogue. I think um, the way you described it, it was done in the, the first instance, which may, may, may kind of like unison, where you know they say a similar word at the exact same time. You can put that in one dialogue block. You don't need to do the, the dual dialogue, dialogue thing. Um, and then Vivian says, for meeting the parents, I learned about subtext. Good. Um, all right. we're. Almost about to wrap up. I want to go to questions now. Kieran, could you f rephrase the question you emailed to me? Because it's, it's a good one. About um, the hero's journey within a short film. I'm doing trying to do a 15-page short film at the moment, and I was wondering if it would be a good or a bad idea to spend the first seven or eight pages all on establishing the ordinary world of the character and then just like powering through the 11 other stages of the hero's journey in like the, the remaining pages so in other words it's like the inciting incident would actually serve as a midpoint reversal kind of thing in in, in that setup is that something that has been done or, and do you think would work or is that kind of a silly idea um i mean nothing is silly until you know it, until it doesn't work right uh, I think the, the, the only thing that uh, I struggle with is seeing how the call to adventure can also be a, a midpoint reversal because you can't have a midpoint reversal without, a, without having a call to adventure in the first place. So they have distinctly different functions. So I wouldn't confuse those. Now, the, the one argument to support your idea would be that what you have is the story is actually speeding up. So you, you start a, at a kind of leisurely pace, you know, uh, uh, showing the ordinary world, and then you speed up the story. And there's not, you know, there can't be anything wrong with the audience having the sense that things are moving faster now. Um, the, the only downside may be that it feels like it's over very sudden and we haven't had, uh, you know, uh, value for our money. So when you, when you set up the, the ordinary world and you take, say, you know, six, seven, eight pages for that, then you're basically signal, signaling to the viewers, ah, now we're going into the second act and we're going to go a little bit deeper and then suddenly it's all over. So that may be awkward, may be weird because we have an innate sense of balance and structure and um, that may be, uh, you know, that may come into play, that may be a problem. But I'm, uh, I'm also the first to admit that short stories 
escape short films escape the proportions of the hero's journey structure uh, at times now I'm not sure if it was with your class, but a short film that, it, that runs for 19 minutes that I sometimes analyze with my students is called The God of Love. God of Love was um, an Oscar winning black and white, uh, black comedy. Uh, it's a black comedy, it's a romance. It's a romantic comedy that, um, that I thought was incredibly powerful. And that is structured very um, elegantly and, and quite traditionally, following the hero's journey and going through all the stages, giving them time. I mean, there's a reason why most stories that work have those in those proportions so i'd say try it have people read it and see what the feedback is and then you can see whether they experience those story elements as the stages that you intend them to be because that that's often the most important thing that as a writer you see those stages as being as you say called to adventure within a longish ordinary world but how does the how does the reader uh, experience that that may be, may be somewhat different. Um, I just want to make a comment on the slug line and mini slug line. And uh, I'm comparing the script of Gravity and the Born Ultimatum. And um, in the Gravity, you have mini slug line that just, when you read it, it flows. While in the board ultimatum, there's the, the page is crammed with slug line, slug line, slug line. And um, in the discussion, you know, from screenwriting, there's one script, uh, one writer who has had many of his screenplay produced. He said to use a second one because producers always need to break down all the scenes for costing and also for shooting purposes so whatever script we submit they will just have to rewrite it in that format so i wonder what is your opinion about that yeah i would say you need to sell it before anyone thinks about production and if it's it's a tough read um it's going to be tougher to sell it. Um, if you have a, a page turner, um, and you, you know the most important things that you know, you understand. Um, and mini slug lines, you probably mean uh, what we call secondary slug line, slug lines. Um, it is a, it's an accepted format. Um, David Trottier suggested in his book. Therefore, it is, it's a suggested and accepted format. Um, I would not write, because we, remember we made that distinction between the spec script and the production script. You're going to leave out certain technical elements. Um, we looked at the Nolan version of writing action. It was not effective because you had just had too many uh, slug lines there. If you have a s secondary slug, you're actually signaling to the reader that you know your stuff. You know there should be a slug line, but for the sake of readability, you're making it a secondary slug rather than making it a full slug. And um, there are so many other things that will have to happen before production anyway that, you know, doing a proper breakdown and identifying these as, as new scenes is going to be the least of it. First, you need to sell. And in order to sell, you need to give the reader a great experience. So I would disagree and I would not put in the full slug lines because, it, as you say, it feels cluttered. But, you know, that said, there's always the odd one out. There's always producers who are technical and going, oh, this, this screenwriter clearly doesn't know what they're doing. But I would, I would ignore those. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for joining. Um, and if you have questions for next week, just email them to me. Next week, we're talking about writing the first draft. I would also like to hear from you guys. If you are writing uh, a first draft, what your experience is in that. And for now, have a great weekend and see you all next week. Bye.